Welcome and aloha. My name is Mark Schlav. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. While the impeachment inquiry of President Trump is proceeding in Washington, D.C., we've had our own ongoing impeachment proceedings in Honolulu. Today, I will be discussing the current impeachment proceedings against Honolulu prosecutor Keith Kaneshiro. My guest today is Keith Kiyuchi. Keith Kiyuchi is the attorney who represents Tracy Yoshimura. Tracy Yoshimura is the man who has filed the petitions to impeach Honolulu prosecutor Keith Kaneshiro. Keith and I will discuss the current status of the impeachment proceedings against the Honolulu prosecutor and where they're going. Keith, welcome. Thank you. Um, okay. What are these impeachment proceedings all about? What's the basis for them? Please. So, so last December, December of 2018, we filed a petition for impeachment of the city prosecutor. And the impetus for that really was the ongoing uh, investigation of Catherine Kelo, but also involved in December of last year, November of last year, we made aware that Mr. Kaneshiro got a target letter so that's what uh, caused us to first file the first uh, impeachment petition. That grinded through the court. And ultimately, uh, because our signatures, which supported the petition, were mostly electronic, uh, Judge Crabtree dismissed that. So we filed a petition for writ of mandamus with the Hawaii Supreme Court November 15th. And shortly before that, we filed a second petition for impeachment to try to. Uh, get the issue back in front of the circuit court, but it would be pending what the Supreme Court decided on the petition for writ of mandamus. Okay, so you, you've told us a lot. Yes, I got <laughs> all it, all right. yeah. Okay, now, I mean, what is the purpose of an impeachment petition or petition for impeachment? What, what, what's the goal of all of that? It's to remove the prosecutor from office. Um, this Honolulu City Charter has a uh, recall uh, a recall proceedings as, as impeachment proceedings. So impeachment proceedings of like a mayor or city council member or the prosecutor requires 500 signatures. And then it goes to the Honolulu Circuit Court where a circuit court judge decides whether under the city charter there's been malfeasance, misfeasance, or nonfeasance oh, committed. Okay, all right. So, uh, all right. Now, so the purpose is to get rid of the prosecutor. Right. And there, the basis is this malfeasance, the, misfeasance, or nonfeasance. Non and a lot of people, what, what does that mean, yeah, right? Yeah. So uh, you, the language actually goes back to the 1920s when the, the impeachment provisions first show up in the city charter. Uh, malfeasance is basically an act committed by an individual. Uh, misfeasance is you commit an act but do it negligently or sloppily. And nonfeasance is you had a duty to commit an act but you didn't do it. Yeah. So in our case, uh, while we cited all three, I think um, in a lot of respects it's nonfeasance or what he did. Okay, all right. Or didn't I, do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so in this particular case, mm -hmm. in your petition, what is the nonfeasance, or what? What are the the acts? And the target letter is that part of it too? The it, target letter is part it, of that. What? What? What, for, yeah, what, what is a target letter? The target letter is something that um, federal prosecutors send to somebody saying that you're the target of a federal investigation. Um, it's different than a subject letter. A subject letter says you may be a, a subject part of the investigation. Target letter means you're specifically targeted, that you will be indicted, and it's basically a letter going out saying, hey, come in, cooperate, that's what the gist of the letter is. So, so Prosecutor Keith Kaneshiro got a target letter yes. from the federal government. Right. And what was that about? You, 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 we don't you, know. You don't I mean, we don't know. I mean, you know, there are things we suspect that he did or didn't do, some of them um, involving Catherine K. Aloha, which is what all of the centers on, some of it involving other investigations. We can see that with the number of people who have been called in front of the grand jury and what you read in the press, 
there's more than just the Catherine K. Law aspect of the investigation. But we really don't know. We know that he got a target letter. But well, it's, it's pretty serious, for, yes. uh, especially for a yes. prose Honolulu prosecutor, right? right. I mean, is that yes. Okay, now, besides the target letter, is there anything else? That, yes. That, okay. What, what's so that? what we've also alleged is his lack of supervision over people in his office. And the two examples are Catherine Kealoha and his first deputy, Chastis Sapolu, because Chastis Sapolu got a subject letter, meaning that you're, you know, you're subject to investigation by the federal government. But a lot of our focus is on what he di didn't do with Catherine Kealoha. And that kind of sure. Yes, what Kaneshiro didn't do with Catherine Kello, and the examples have been published in the in the, the press, especially Hawaii News Now, where they've talked about how she was actually assigned to her brother's own investigation. She was in, assigned to her uncle's own investigation, so she was controlling a lot of things. And you know, our view is that. You know, Mr. Kaneshiro certainly should have known this or checked that because he's head of the office. And she has no immediate superior other than Mr. Kaneshiro. But one of the things we also mentioned in the latest petition was the Dr. Ito letter, which surfaced in, with the press. The Dr. Ito letter was a letter that was written sometime in, I believe, 2014, and it talked about how. Catherine Kealoha was disabled and was in, unable to go through a deposition, uh, which was curious because this is 2014 and she's going through and prosecuting a lot of criminal cases. And our allegation is really once that letter came out, and certainly Mr. Kaneshiro knew about it in June of 2014 because there were federal proceedings uh, where that letter or her personnel file was subpoenaed. And Mr. Kanshu was represented in federal court by this corporation counsel office. So there was knowledge of that letter, knowledge of what was in that letter. What, what was the letter with respect to? Or what, the letter was really saying that she didn't have the capacity to, she was undergoing some type of treatment with this Dr. Ido. She didn't have the capacity to appear at a deposition space specifically said deposition, because what she was trying to do is avoid a deposition in the lawsuit that was filed by her uncle and oh, grandmother. Okay. So that's why the letter was concocted. Now, a lot of people have said, well, it was obviously a concocted letter. The doctor made that up, so she really wasn't disabled. That's kind of not the point. You know, the point, if you're the city prosecutor, is that if you knew about the letter, you certainly knew about it in June of 2014, you should have investigated the circumstances you did it. And so what I hear you saying is she was active in the prosecutor's office at the same time. Is yes. That, is that right? And yet there was a letter that got her off being deposed. Right. Oh, and, the, and the letter is from a doctor that said she was unable to be deposed because of a medical, medical condition. Which so it doesn't seem to add up. It doesn't add up, but at the very least it's, it's nonfeasance. So if you're a prosecutor and that's your immediate superior, head of your quote-unquote career criminal unit, you should be looking into that, and he did look into that, which is kind of our whole point. So the, um, the petition for impeachment that we filed in 2018 is different than the one we just filed. The one we just filed includes the allegations about the Ido letter because we just found out about that. And even the circumstances of those federal proceedings are kind of strange. Initially, uh, all of those proceedings were sealed, and then civil beat got them unsealed, and then they were resealed three days later. So we were able to get copies of the files during the, during the three, four day period when they were unsealed. So we have all of, all of that information. And it's very enlightening because Mr. Conisher was a party that sought to quash the subpoena in federal courts. So that's why he's got knowledge of it. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So, so that, that's a fact I, I, I wasn't aware of either. Yeah. And, and a lot of it, it really was if you're a party, then it doesn't matter whether it was in her personnel file. Right. It doesn't matter you know whether you, you, know, you knew about it in June of 2014. So, what did you do after that? And part of why I think my client, Mr. Yoshimura, was so upset was because in the fall of 2014, he tried to get the first indictment against him 
first indictment, criminal against indictment against him and, and his co-defendants, dismissed with prejudice. So this, the Ito letter Ms. was Ms. never Yoshimura disclosed. Yes, was uh, indicted or right. had a had a criminal case against him, which was ultimately resolved. Was the first case was dismissed because the prosecutor's office felt that it. There were things that went on that was inappropriate. And one of the things the press focused on was the fact that the first indictment occurred on May 1st, 2014, and the ETO letter was still in effect. So she, it has been pointed out by the press, effectively, she did Hawaii's largest gambling indictment on May 1st, 2014. Well, she was incompetent. Right, exactly. Exactly. So th that's an I interesting see. question. So, it, so Mr. Yoshimura was indicted yes. for gambling or... For, for these, what they call products direct sweepstakes. So okay. his position, and, yes. And, uh, and she was the prosecutor right. for that case, and she was all, had been ruled incompetent. Or she had, had, a had, letter. had a letter from a doctor saying she really wasn't able to do... Right. Here in a deposition, so why should she be able to work... As a prosecutor, is that what your right. argument would be? Right, exactly, and that's I and see. that's kind of the position the press has been taking: is how in the world could you do that and you have this letter? Well, again, a lot of people have said, "Well, the letter is concocted," but it doesn't matter whether the letter is concocted; the letter exists and the knowledge of it. Right, and and I think the question becomes: Well, did Mr. Kaneshiro have the personnel fault? You know what? It doesn't, doesn't really matter because yeah. he knew about it in June of 2000, 2014. Because he was a party of the. His party in the case when wow. they tried to quash the subpoena. So he certainly had knowledge about it. Okay, so you were the attorney for Mr. Y Yoshimura at the time. Is uh, that correct? Back in, actually, in 2014, Miles first represented him, Miles Briner. Miles Briner. Okay. And Miles represented him because we thought that I would be called as a witness. And the reason I would be called as a witness, because in Tracy's first indictment, they indicted him for conduct on arcades that he did not own. Back in 2014, he owned no arcade. Yet, despite that, they traced all of these machines to arcades that they said that he owned, and we knew that was false. So at that time in 2014, it looked like I'd be a fact that he would. Because? Because I would be able to attest to the fact that he didn't own oh, any, any, any of I those arcades. So uh, it was a little different in 2016 when he was re-indicted. Uh, at some point, it was apparent that I would no longer be a fact-based witness. So Miles and I together represented him. And, and those cases, the criminal cases against him, were ultimately They dismissed. were dismissed. He was indicted a second time in February of 2016. That case was ultimately dismissed uh, on a speedy trial ground. Uh, the employees' case, uh, employees were indicted separately. They were dismissed on different grounds. Uh, mainly for in part prosecutorial misconduct, in part speedy trial. So there were different bases for the employees being dismissed. And, and there's no longer any There's no matters. longer any case. The prosecutors never appealed, despite the fact that the judge that made the ruling anticipated an appeal, but the prosecutors never appealed either. So after that, Mr. Yoshimura was concerned about what was happening in the yes. prosecutor's Officer. Yes, and, and that's kind of what led, and, and I think the natural question is, why would you do that? I, yeah. think, I think part of it was, obvi you know, obviously there's some animosity. I think a large part of that is Tracy really felt that when a lot of the things came out about Catherine Gillow, that this just wasn't right, that there were things that Kaneshiro, Mr. Kaneshiro knew about and should have prevented, and one of them was this prosecutor kind of going rogue, so to speak, you know, in the office. Because a lot of the things that have since come out, like her prosecuting her own brother's case or prosecuting her uncle's case. I mean, you talk about an abuse of power. We talk about that on the national level. But on the local level, that's an ultimate abuse of power. So Mr. Yoshimura felt that he had some duty or obligation to yes. undertake that. Okay. We're going to take a short break, yeah. and then we're going to come back. And I want to... I know where we are now with all these sure. petitions, where we're going, what, okay. what do you think is going to happen? So we're going to take a break right now and be right back. Thank you. Hi, guys. I'm your host, Lillian Kumik from Lillian's Vegan World. I'm, I come to you live every second Friday from 3 p.m. 
and this is the show where I talk about the plant-based lifestyle and veganism. So we go through recipes, some upcoming events, uh, information about health, regarding your health, and uh, just some ideas on how you can have a better lifestyle, eat healthier, and have fun at the same time. So do join me. I look forward to seeing you, and uh, aloha. Aloha, Stan the Energy Man here. You can see me every Tuesday at 3 p.m. here on Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, we're not on Friday anymore, so don't be looking for me on Friday. I'm on Tuesday at 3 here on Think Tech, coming to you live and direct from the beautiful studios in downtown Honolulu, Pioneer Plaza. So please join me, and we'll talk everything about hydrogen and clean energy, not only for Hawaii, but for the whole wide world. Aloha. Welcome back. I am Mark Schlav, host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program, and I am here with Keith Uchi, and we are talking about petitions to impeach Prosecutor Keith Kaneshiro that Mr. Kiyuchi has filed on behalf of Tracy Yoshimura. And Keith, uh, when we were talking, uh, there, there is really pending petitions, yes. right? There's, there's two, and one, one was dismissed by Judge Crabtree because right. of signatures. Right. I, I'd like you to explain that, but, but then I also, what, what's the next petition and what's the mandamus about? But first, why did Judge Crabtree dismiss the first petition because of the electronic signatures? Well, the primary basis he dismissed it, and we cited to him, there's a Hawaii Electronic Signatures Act, I believe it's 497. And he said that, and the city said that they had the right under 497 to reject the electronic signatures, but that's not the way the statute reads. The way the statute reads, what we assert is that the city can carve out an exception, but uh, our position has been that they need to adopt rules under Chapter 91, the Hawaii Administrative Procedures Act, in order to carve out that exception, which they didn't do. It's kind of a strange statute because the Hawaii Electronic Signatures Act, on one hand, says you have to accept the electronic signatures. On the other hand, it says this shall not uh, prevent the government from rejecting the electronic signatures. But in that same section of the statute, it says that they have to specifically state what the exceptions are. So you, you, your basic argument, as I hear you saying it, mm -hmm. is was the, uh, the law says you can have electronic signatures right. uh, unless you have a rule that says you can't. Right. And they didn't create a rule. They were just right. making a sort of ad hoc Decision. Well, and that's the whole idea because you, Chapter 91 exists because you can't just pull the law out of the air. You have to have, you have to go through public hearings. You have to give notice and people would testify. Uh, and ironically, there's a very similar case in U Utah Supreme Court decided case, Anderson v. Bell, that was almost on an identical statute. And they said, no, you've, you've got to, you can't just arbitrarily reject the electronic signature. And, and there is no law in Hawaii, right, that says you can't have electronic uh, signatures for petitions to impeach right. the prosecutor? There's no law. There's no law like that. It doesn't go that detail. In fact, part of the problem we have, as the press has pointed out, is there is no law on a lot of the issues we're dealing with, I mean, even under the city charter provision. So that makes it kind of challenging because the press is wanting to know, you know, define malfeasance, misfeasance, and nonfeasance. Which makes it difficult. So what what was the Corporation Council and the city clerk's argument about the about the electronic uh, signatures that I mean why did they say they are not good and why do you say they are? Well they they said that there was room for fraud and and they didn't specify what the fraud would be. Mm -hmm. uh, by that time, by the time we were in front of Judge Crabtree on that issue, uh, Tracy, Mr. Yoshimura, had secured a different platform. So initially, when we filed the first petition, we went through change.org. And change.org did not have the protections that DocuSign had. And DocuSign is used not only in courts, but it's used across the nation for all kinds of transactions. So he used DocuSign as a platform. And to distinguish between the two petitions, the first petition was filed using change.org. 
The second petition was used with a combination of electronic signatures from DocuSign. So everything in DocuSign has an audit trail, so you can trace it back, so you eliminate the fraud. And, and in the state of Hawaii, can we, are, are there instances that you can use um, electronic signatures for, for legal matters? Yeah, in fact, you can use electronic signatures to register to vote. I mean, you can uh, register online. You can also use electronic signatures, and now the courts take electronic filing, which means that you don't have any wet signatures on any document. Uh, give you a good example, and this is what we argued in front of Judge Crabtree, is that DocuSign is used by all sorts of companies, including I do work for a structured settlement purchase company called J.J. Wentworth, and J.J. Wentworth used nothing but electronic signatures in their documents. The courts accept that pursuant to the Hawaii Electronic Signatures Act, so why wouldn't they accept that for a petition? Okay, now, so one case was dismissed, yes. you filed another, and you've asked the Supreme Court to review the first case. Where is the status? Where do you go from here? What, what, where do we, what's the next step? What are you waiting for? So right now, we filed a petition for writ of mandamus we've, um, on November 15th. With Supreme, the Supreme Court. With the Supreme Court, and they're reviewing that. And we filed a second um, impeachment petition uh, just before that. I think it's the, my recollection, the 11th of November. And that's scheduled for hearing on January 3rd, 23rd. But that doesn't go because the judge grabs his ruling unless the Supreme Court grants the transfer to mandamus. So the original decision by Judge Crabtree will control unless the Supreme Court says it's not right. Right, and we could, you know, it's pointed out we could appeal it, but the, but the real reason we, I can still file the appeal, I have until this week Friday to file the appeal, which we'll do, but the writ of mandamus is really the main, the main avenue we need to seek, because if we don't get a writ of mandamus, then we don't make the end of the year deadline. What is that about? The end of the year deadline is unless he's, Mr. Conisher, is removed from office by December 31st. The city charter says that the first deputy replaces him, and if the first deputy doesn't exist or for some reason doesn't want it, then the mayor appoints him. So Mr. Yoshimura's position has always been the voters should decide. The people. The people should decide. The people should have the power of the ballot box. You see, uh, you know, at least a couple of candidates running for prosecutors right. said that you know, they want to clean the office up, they want to you know, remove the distrust that exists, and I think that's the power of the ballot box. We haven't, either Mr. Yoshimura and I have taken a position as to which candidate would be appropriate, but we do think that the voters should decide, not, and the first deputy certainly shouldn't be the one going in, uh, especially under the circumstances where he's under a microscope right now, and the mayor shouldn't appoint with all due respect to the mayor, that should be the power of the people in the ballot box. So you have to know by December 31st whether well, he's going to be you removed. You have to have a decision. Right? And that's going to be, okay, yeah, that's a tough timeline. So, so you still have to have a hearing. All right. So, and today uh, is what, the 9th. Right. So you have to have a decision with enough time to have a hearing. Right. In order to win or lose at the hearing, I suppose. I right. Mean, I guess. It, What's the procedure at the hearing? The judge hears evidence? And yeah, the judge would hear evidence. I mean, it's not real clear because prior to, um, they changed the law, I think, after the Reen Mancho impeachment, where it used to be with the Supreme Court, and now it's with a circuit court judge. Why they changed the law is kind of curious because the Supreme Court, as you know, wouldn't take evidence as much as they would take, uh, I guess, briefing. Maybe that's why they did it, because maybe the circuit court judge needs to take evidence of what Balfies and Misfies and Sinanfies said. I mean, that's what we first contemplated, and um, that was kind of the schedule that Judge Crabtree had set out. So, so you're waiting. We're waiting. We have the second petition was filed, like I said, um, just before the writ was filed. We have a January 23rd hearing, but... That January 23rd hearing is not going to go unless the everything's Court kind of dependent on what the Supreme Court, what the does. Supreme Court yeah. does. And if they do not grant your mandamus, then you would appeal. Right. And 
then who knows how long that'll take. Right. And the question is, you know, and I pointed out in my writ of mandamus, I mean, even, you know, even the December 31st deadline, as important that is, I mean, the practical matter is can we have an appeal heard by the time it becomes moot? I do not want it to become moot because I think this is an important issue. So, right. I mean, the argument is it becomes moot once the elections are held. Well, I kind of disagree with that. Actually I think before. Of, before. Well, technically, he's the, the prosecutor's in office until December 31st, which is yeah. kind of an interesting, mm. you know, it's kind of different than the governor. But anyway. Um, and so he is still the prosecutor. Right. But he is no longer in the office. Right. That, that was something happened because of the attorney general? The attorney general filed a petition in February of this year to ask him to be suspended from the practice of law because he got the target letter. And it's Claire it, Connors. It's Claire Connors. Right? And as a well result of that, he took leave. But I think what the voters would find offensive, he's still collecting his salary. Um, he's been seen at least once in the parking lot with his administrative assistant, um, which I really got some issues with. And I think uh, Mr. Yoshimura does as well. So I think the best thing is to remove him from office. You move them from office, the sooner you can get the electorate to decide who goes in. Whether we have one election or two elections, I think that's important. In the time we have left, why should we care? I mean, why not just let it, let it go? Why I think we should care because our government should not have the kind of stint that it does now. Frankly, I think this whole Kealoha matter just doesn't involve kind of sure, but I think the entire matter has made people distrustful of government, distrustful of the criminal justice system, and they have every right to do that. And I think, as I said, a lot of the people running as candidates for city prosecutor want to restore the public trust. I think a lot of the things that have been alleged and a lot of things have happened, like DUI cases being dismissed or the electrician's tickets being fixed, that may be small, but that's a symptom of what's wrong with the system because what you shouldn't have is a power that goes beyond all of that. I mean, an absolute power, and this is what's going on in Washington, D.C. right now, is that if you've got that kind of power, that power needs to be curbed. So I think that's why people should care. People should care whenever there is an abuse of power by any of our elected officials. And anybody under him. And I think that's why people. Keith, thank you very much. Uh, Keith Kiyuchi, uh, we'll, the next few days. See what will, happens. will be important. Yeah. And we'll see what happens in all of this, in the petitions uh, to impeach Keith Kaneshiro, the prosecutor. And that's it. That's it for today. Thank you very much. I'll see you in the new year. Aloha. Aloha.